Chris Hensley is a registered representative of Cambridge Investment Research, Inc., a broker-dealer member of FINRA, SIPIC, investment advisor representative of Cambridge Investment Research Advisors, Inc., a registered investment advisor. Cambridge and Houston First Financial Group are not affiliated. The Houston Midtown Chapter of the Society for Financial Awareness presents Money Matters with your host, Christopher Hensley. Good morning, everybody. You're listening to Money Matters on KPFT Houston. It's 10 a.m. I'm Chris Hensley, and we have a great show lined up for you today. A couple of years ago, I, I did a show with the directors of Tiny, a story about living small, Merrick Mueller and Christopher Smith. And this was an, uh, it's actually gotten, it got picked up on Netflix after we, we uh, had the show and talked about the tiny house and the tiny house lifestyle. Since then, we've had several shows dealing with retirees and having to downsize their home. Our guest today has done just that. But when we talk about dying, downsizing, she has managed to live in a 90 square foot home. Now, when I say 90 square foot, think about 12 by seven and a half feet. This is roughly the size of a Honda Accord. And so when she did this, uh, there were many things that she discovered along the way that has to do with organizing and downsizing that I think will be very valuable for people who are looking to downsize in general. So please stay tuned. Our guest, Felice Cohen, who is the author of the book, 90 Lessons for Living Large in 90 Square Feet, will be joining us very, very shortly. So please stay tuned. If you're a regular listener, you know that we always use the first first few minutes of the show to tell you a little bit about SOFA, uh, the Society for Financial Awareness, who we are and what we do. We are the Houston Midtown chapter of SOFA. We are a 501c3 nonprofit educational speakers bureau, and our mission is to fight financial illiteracy. We do that by going out to different companies, different organizations, different groups, anywhere people already congregate and we provide financial education seminars as well as health and wellness workshops. So what does this look like? Well, most of the time these are going to be lunch and learns, brown bag type seminars uh, provided at your employer. We're going to focus on topics around the finances. Uh, it may be budgeting. It may be retirement and investing. It may be getting out of credit card debt, purchasing your first home, uh, saving for college education for your children. The list goes on and on. Why? Why would a company or organization have us come out to deliver these talks? Well, for one thing, there's something called 404C. And 404C is an ERISA requirement that states that any company that has an ERISA-sponsored retirement plan is required to have a financial literacy or financial education piece at least once a year. So we go out and, and help them fulfill this. Uh, often they try to outsource this to their 401k or 403b guy. And when that happens, typically it's going to be maybe uh, asset allocation or maybe they're going to show you how to log on to the website. But you don't see a deep dive into the actual education part of it. And that's what SOFA is really, really good about. All of these talks are free. They are pro bono by uh, experts in the community. I am a, f a licensed financial advisor. Um, if you wanted to talk about wills, then we have a member who is an attorney who would come out and talk about wills and estate planning. If you wanted to talk about first-time home purchases, this might be a realtor. Uh, stress in the workplace, that might be a healthcare professional. To find out more about SOFA and how you can have somebody come out to your work or professional association, you can reach out to us at www.houston.com. MidtownSofa.org. If you are listening outside of the Houston or Gulf Coast region and you'd like to have somebody come out to your city or state, you can reach out to the national office, which is www.SofaUSA.org. And with that, let's go ahead and get Felice on the line here. Felice, are you there? 
Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We're, we're very excited to, to have you on the show here because um, listeners might have seen you and may not even have realized that because you are there was a YouTube uh, say YouTube phenomenon that came out when you uh, first started down the road on, on your uh, your experiment here. Can you for, can you start by maybe telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, I grew up on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. I currently live in New York City. I'm an author. I'm a professional organizer and I'm also a Holocaust educator. And I saw that on the uh, the the bio that the, this this new book that's coming out. And by the way, the book is called Ninety Lessons for Living Large in Ninety Square Feet." Uh, but this is not your first book; that you actually have a, another book out as well. Yeah, and it's all, it's actually also tied with the tiny apartment because it's the reason I moved into that tiny apartment in the first place. I had been working with my grandfather on a book about his life. He was a Holocaust survivor, and I wanted to quit my job and finish writing this book I'd been working on for years. And I, that's where the tiny apartment came in. The rent at the time was seven hundred dollars, which you know in Manhattan is might as well be free. And, uh, yes, the place was tiny, but it allowed me to quit my job and finish working on that book with him, which I wrote really as a gift for him, but it's gone on to sell thousands and thousands of copies around the world, thanks in part to the video that went viral. Well, now tell us about that, because as I as I did my research and got ready for the show here, I realized, you know, I saw this video when it came out, and it was a huge uh, kind of a, it hit the web. And it, tell us about that YouTube video that kind of started it. Sure. So I had written for um, a newspaper in New York about how to live tiny, and then I was contacted by a woman who made videos of tiny apartments around the world, and she asked if she could make one of mine, and she came in and made it in about an hour and a half, took all the footage, and she left. And I really didn't think about it again because I was getting ready to launch my grandfather's book. And then all of a sudden, about six months later, it just went viral and uh, landed on the Yahoo homepage. I was on television around the world. It was kind of this beginning of this tiny house movement. And in the years since, this tiny house movement has just really expanded. Um, there are a number of festivals around the country. I'm actually going to a number. I'm going to one in Canada next week. And people are learning and wanting to live with less because, you know, it's it's better life cho- choice. You get more experiences than more stuff. And that's really been, I think, the big the big draw. I love it. I love it. Now, as a, as a financial advisor, I'm an independent. Uh, my office is about the size of the 90 square feet room that you you uh, that you lived in. Uh, I always think it's funny because I I used to work at Merrill Lynch and UBS, and there would be these mm. giant uh, lawyer like mahogany desks when you come in. And now when people come and see me, they're pretty thrown off when they walk into a single room with a desk. And, and so I'm when I'm listening to this, you talk about organizing. There's lots of things. And one of the things that I when I was listening to the the video in the book that your your uh, grandfather kind of inspired you to that you talked about don't acquire what you can't afford. And so I really like that message. Can you tell me how this whole um, experience has affected your finances? Sure. So, you know, I grew up um, in a pretty large house, and I thought I would always live in a large house. And um, my dad's a bankruptcy attorney, so we learned early on, you don't spend for what you don't have to pay for it. And when I moved into this tiny space, I thought I would stay there a year. I had quit. Um, I was chief of staff to a college president. I quit that job, and I thought, again, I would just stay for one year. I put 77 boxes of stuff into storage. I figured then I would get a big apartment, probably move to the Burbs, get another job. But after that first year, my life got so much better. I suddenly had less stress. I had even more savings. I've always been a good saver. And when I had that job as chief of staff, I knew I didn't want it forever. So I really saved I saved like I was making half of what I was making because I knew you never know a rainy day. And then at the end of that first year in that 90 square foot apartment, I, my stress was down. I was writing. I had more free time to do what I love to do, and I thought I'm staying another year. And then I stayed another and another, and I stayed in that tiny apartment five years, and I only left because I was evicted. But the, um, the, I saved so much money because in a smaller space, your expenses are less. You don't have room to store stuff, so your credit card bills are less, and you're not buying stuff, which really is the culprit that keeps us from saving and really doing the things we love to do, which I talk about a lot in the book. 
Now, you, you said quite a bit there that I, I, I wanted to point out because it's very powerful. Uh, you mentioned being able to sa- save half of what you make. I, I know when I work with people, even getting them to save 10% or 20% is, is like pulling teeth. People don't realize mm-hmm. that they should be saving uh, more. The, the, they're, they're, they have unrealistic expectations there. But for you to be able to save 50% of your earned income, that is huge. The benefit of that, not only were you able to save and save and save, but you mentioned low stress, that you had the peace of mind, that that you didn't have this giant uh, housing expense, or not just the housing expense, but everything else that goes along with having what you call, quote, quote, stuff, all that other, that clutter. And so I know we'll we'll, we'll talk about this here here in a moment. In fact, let's go ahead and talk about that now. Uh, what are some of the tips that you might give somebody who is interested in downsizing, whether it's a retiree, whether it's really anybody? Well, I think the first thing you have to do is see where you're, if you're moving, whether you're moving or staying in the same place and you want to get rid of stuff. As you go through, you've got to break it down because it's like giving a baby small pieces of food. You don't give them a big piece of food. They'll choke. And the same when you look at all your stuff, you get overwhelmed. So I tell people, you know, you go room for room, pick a room, pick a section, pick a shelf, and try to just get rid of five things, maybe five things a day. But, you know, I say five things a day because it takes the pressure off thinking I have to do a lot. But what happens is you get rid of five things that you say you don't need or somebody else can use it or you don't really love it or, or picture it in your own home. Once you do five, you think, well, I can do five more. So you're starting in small steps. But when you think about what you want your new home to look like, you really just want the stuff you love. And, I mean, we're, we're consumers. That's what we do. We buy stuff. And things are often cheap enough that we buy a lot, but that's really where the problem begins. It's in the shopping because we buy stuff because it's on sale, not because we love it all the time. And then we bring it home and we realize we don't even use it. So, you know, if you're looking to retire, I'm here on the Cape right now helping my parents kind of get rid of stuff. And I, my mom loves this game. We take a set of dice and we go in a room and we roll the dice. Whatever number we get, that's how many things she has to get rid of, and we donate it, or uh, we just we get rid of it. And um, you have to do it in small pieces, but really focus on what you really want to have with you in, in your new home. So that that's huge. Uh, you mentioned the baby steps of not doing it. I know it would be scary for many people to to get rid of a lot of things all at once, but doing it. It just you said five things a day or just a small number a day just to get them started and moving towards that direction um what did you what was one of the biggest things that you learned from this from getting rid of stuff or living in the tiny apartment either <laughs> both <laughs> <laughs> I learned a lot one well one I realized even though I thought I would one day live in a large home like the one I grew up in, I realized that is not what I want at all. I never want to be, um, you know, have a lot of space. A, you have to clean it. You have to fill it with stuff. You have to pay for it. And I would rather get on my bike. I would rather go on my stand-up paddleboard or travel or spend time with family. I'm able to come to Cape Cod for the summer and leave my apartment in New York because I've set it up like that for myself because it's more important to me to have less stuff. And we look around. We look in our closets. Look at the stuff we're not wearing. We have stuff on our shelves we don't use, books we don't read. And, you know, at this point you can't feel bad about all the stuff, but you can donate it, and that will make you feel better knowing you can give it to someone else. But really it's about what you want out of life. And when I work with a client, I don't start by saying, what should we get rid of? I start by saying, what makes you happy? And when I hear what that is, I say, we're going to work towards that. Because for a lot of people, what keeps them from doing what they love to do is stuff. Because you have to work to pay for the stuff, you have to clean the stuff, you have to move the stuff to get to the other stuff. So it's so much time I'm trying to give them back by helping them to get rid of stuff. I think that's interesting is starting with what makes me happy. And, and one of the things that you learned was that the big house, uh, which you thought maybe was something you wanted, was not really what you wanted. And, and even to have the freedom to make that realization, most people d- d- fall into one side and they're just stuck with that. And they, they never think about the uh, the alternatives or the other options that are there uh, for those of you who are just joining us we are talking with felice cohen she is the author of the new book 90 lessons for living large in 90 square foot don't worry you don't have to have a pen to, to write that down we will repeat that information again on at the towards the end of the show uh, it, tell us while we while we're on it tell us about the new book 
Sure. So it's actually 90 lessons for living large and 90 square feet or more. you got to get the or more in there because people will think, oh, no, just 90 square feet. Um, I don't expect anybody to live in 90 square feet. I know the challenge of that. But the book... I, you know, as an author, I had wanted to write a book about organizing, but there are already so many books on how to organize, and I didn't really want to add to that clutter. So I thought, how can I make this book different? So the book tells about how living small made my life larger, gave me more time to do the things I love to do, but it's also filled with 90 easy motivational lessons to help you get rid of stuff, to downsize, to live the life you want to live. And I call the book a want-to guide. Because it's just to help you, to motivate you to live the life you want to live. And so some of the lessons, it's, it's like um, for everything you buy, think of it as one more day of working to pay for it. Because, you know, everything has a price and interest in credit cards. So that's really how the book kind of came out. And um, it's really starting to strike a nerve with people because it's easy to read. For people who are overwhelmed with their stuff, reading a whole book on how to organize can be even more overwhelming. So I wanted to do something that was simple and, you know, that would replace me from standing there in your home with you to help you get rid of stuff. Well, that that's huge because I, I work a lot with retirees, and, and if it's mm-hmm. somebody who has decided to downsize, there is a lot of anxiety around that. I mean, I, when we start talking about... Um, you know, if people get to a point where they've run out of funds and the question is, are, am I going to stay in my home? Am I going to downsize? Um, and you start, you'll see hand wringing where people will just start rubbing their hands together. And, and uh, yeah. many people don't like the idea of leaving their home and they don't realize that some of the things that we're doing might be liberating. I like the idea that it's simple because it's something that they can, uh, get these motivational, um, mm-hmm. ideas towards downsizing. Very, very neat. Um, now when we talk about organizing, I mentioned I'm in a small office and, uh, that, that's one of the things. What are some of the things that you can point out for people about just simple organ organizing well one thing for you in a small office you know you can tell your clients you don't have a large overhead so you're not p- passing on that expense to them so that's exactly yeah, right a small office. yeah it's great um so organizing tips for downsizing you know when when the video first came out and i still get emails from people i had some People write to me to say, you know, I had to move because of finances into a smaller place and I felt so bad about it. But after watching your video and hearing what you said, I feel better about my new space. And I think part of it is how you look at the glass, you know, is it half full, half empty. But like you said, it can be liberating. Um, You know, I say getting rid of stuff can feel like getting out of debt because you have all this stuff and, and it can be overwhelming as well. And I think, you know, retiring is just moving on, is graduating to another stage. And as you go through stuff and as you go through things, it's not easy. And I think you go through one thing at a time and think of people who will appreciate it. And then you'll feel better about giving it away. But also appreciate each thing that you've had and you're letting go of and it was part of your life. So try to look at it as kind of the story of your life and uh, not to think of it as such a bad thing. I like that. I like that. I do that when I when I do start cleaning. Uh, I'll start going down memory lane there. And the other problem I have when it comes to uh, to get, I'm one of these people. If it's free, I'll take it. And then when I, <laughs> my wife's the opposite of that. Is she's if we if we haven't touched it in the last six months, it's garbage. Uh, uh, but and then she'll she'll ask me things like, now why did you take that? You're not going to need it. And it's true. So so we have to watch that kind of stuff. What some of the biggest roadblocks uh, to, to, to going down this road? Well, at first, um, you know, I, there was no kitchen in this tiny apartment, and that took a little adjustment. Um, I did have a toaster oven and a mini fridge and a hot pot that I hadn't had since college, but I was also in Manhattan, so I was in the middle of, you know, Foodville. There were just restaurants everywhere, so that was a little challenge. Um, you know, at first I freaked out about the loft bed, because it was so close, but then I just reminded myself of why I had moved into this small space, and I think that really did the trick, because I I wanted to have that year to finish writing my first book and do this for my grandfather, and I thought about what my grandfather had lived through, and I looked around at this tiny apartment, and I said, this is paradise compared to what he had, and you know, in New York or wherever you live, you're only there to sleep, and when I, when it was a bedroom, when I went to sleep, that's what the whole space was. When I was getting dressed, the whole space was a closet, and when I worked there, the whole space was a cubicle. 
And I think it's a lot of it, it has to do with your perspective. And, you know, for me, my backyard was New York City. So that part got easier. And all the, you know, there were times it was a fifth floor walk up, I'd be tired walking up the stairs, but it was just a little payoff of the bigger picture. And I think that's important to not lose sight of. Absolutely. We're kind of reminding yourself of the why. Why am I doing this? And I, I think a lot of times people will hear something like this and they'll think, well, this is a person who's not, uh, they're, they're having to live like a pauper and they're not doing things. You were involved in art. I saw you, you did Shrinky Dink art. You, did, you mentioned a whole bunch of things that you were passionate about that didn't necessarily stop. Can you tell us a little bit about that? those those other things that you do? Sure. Yeah. And it's not that I had to stop at all. And in fact, I had more time to do these things. So writing was my passion. And that's, you know, I have a number of books that I've written and working on and have the time to do that and have more savings because, you know, enabling me to do that. I love making art. Um, I love and distributing art for years. Um, it was big in the 70s, that plastic you colored and cut and put in the toaster. And it was perfect because it was the only art that would fit in that tiny apartment. <laughs> um, you know, I love to cycle. I love to go to theater. I love to do all these other things. And living like this enabled me to have all these other experiences, which I think is the big draw for many people, downsizing. Um, and even if you live in a larger space, I'm not telling anybody to move into a tiny, tiny space. I'm just saying it's your stuff that you can downsize to give you more free time to do it. You know, and, you know, everybody, you know, Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts, everybody's buying drinks all the time. And I'm not knocking those places, but day after day buying these drinks because you think you deserve it, you know, you're literally flushing your money away. And I think it's, it's, it's good to be conscious of what you're spending your money on and seeing what you really want and what, you know, the big picture of what you really enjoy doing and for me it's getting up on my stand up paddleboard every day. It's you know, it's what I love to do. That's huge. That's huge. I I'd like to kind of uh sidestep just a moment and go back to the first book, What Papa Told Us. Can can you tell us a little bit more about that book for people who are interested in that as well? Sure. So uh I was in college actually and I discovered that my maternal grandmother didn't die of cancer as I've been told, but she committed suicide and uh named after her. And when I when I found that out I called my grandfather and asked him why. And for years they had not told anybody the truth because uh, suicide had such a stigma at the time and in order for him to tell me why she committed suicide he had to tell me what happened to her in the Holocaust. And I wrote about her and my grandfather felt such relief having unburdened himself of her secret, he said, I want you to tell my story. So we worked on this book off and on for uh, 18 years, and um, it wasn't a book at first, and then it just kind of it came out as a book, and I didn't plan on selling a copy. And the book seems to touch a nerve because it's about his life before, during, and after the war. And it's a simple, easy read of one man's story, and as tough as the book can be, it's also about hope. Because he did survive. And the last five years of his life, um, he passed away last December, but he and I would speak together in schools and in synagogues and bookstores across the country, and it changed his life. He was so proud of this book, and he was so proud to tell his story because it really validated for him his survival. So, I, I, you know, I'll never write anything again as worth it as this was. And, um, you know, it's uh, it was a gift. I was doing for him, but really turned into a gift for me. And, and I train other grandchildren of survivors to go into schools and speak. I've spoken to over 10,000 people. Wow. That is, I'm going to have to read that. One of my favorite books is Man's Search for Meaning by Victor Frankl, mm. also a Holocaust survivor. Um, yeah. And and so this is, uh, did, did, we, we were talking about the, the other book, 90 Lessons for Living Large, but this one sounds right up my alley. I'm going to have to check that one out as well. Yeah. Uh, what what have I forgot to ask you that you'd like listeners to know? Uh, I think, you know, I think when you're looking at your stuff, just Take your time and try to break it down and be, you know, be thankful that you're able to buy it and you bought it and you enjoyed it for whatever time, but let it go. And it's, and think of the people you're helping. Think of the, you know, maybe get a tax write off as well. And think of the, how good you feel when it's gone and you're just left with the things that you love. Because that's, that's what, you know, your life should be about. 
Well, Felice, thank you. We are bumping towards the end of the show. Thank you so much for visiting with us today. For listeners who'd like to find out more about Felice, you can visit her website at www.felicecohen, which is, let me spell this out, F-E-L-I-C-E, and then C-O-H-E-N dot com. Um, if you are listening to the podcast version of the show, you can find a link to the website and also the book as well on the podcast notes. Felice, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great weekend there. My pleasure. You too, Christopher. Take care. Have a good one. Thanks. And you have been listening to KPFT Houston. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Money Matters Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, visit us on the web at www.moneymatterspodcast.com. Drop us a line on SpeakPipe on the right-hand corner. Uh, It will receive any voicemails, questions, thoughts, concerns that you have about the show. In addition to this, we recently launched a Patreon campaign. Click on the Donate Now tab to hit the tip jar and find out what Patreon's campaign is all about.